Thanks, everybody. I think that's up and running. Right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, for our network huddle um, on epilepsy. Um, we've got, uh, as per usual, packed agenda this morning. Um, I'm going to just briefly give you an overview of the Child Health and Wellbeing Network. If it's um, new to you, you're not familiar with how we work or where we sit in the system. Um, so then we can get onto the meat of the session as soon as we can. So, all being well, let's move this on. So, who have we got in the room today? Quite a diverse group of people, actually, um, for quite a small group. Um, we've got people from um, uh, local authorities, from um, acute trusts, from VCSE organisations, um, from the ICB, some international guests who have registered who may or may not be with us just now, um, but we hope they will access the recording. So really sort of diverse group of people, which shows the sort of breadth of interest there is in this quite a specialist topic. So that's great to see. Thank you very much for joining us. So the Child Health and Wellbeing Network, um, we are um, a network that runs across the Northeast and North Cumbria. Our vision, as you can see there, um, has been set for us by the system that we work with as we set up um, to um, encourage this collaborative work between organisations. Um, and our main sort of role in the system, if you like, is to share good practice, drive work forward and connect us into experts and groups. And this this huddle um, format that we run enables us, enables us to do just that. So um, it brings people together, shares fantastic work that's happening and enables people to connect um, and learn from each other. So the network sits within the ICS, so across the northeast of North Cumbria. We were set up in 2018. Um, You've just gone on mute, Jen. <clears throat> Apologies, thank you so much. Um, see this, I can't see what I'm doing. Um, so the um, ICS um, is the home of our work. So we sit within the North East and North Cumbria footprint. Um, we have a growing remit um, in the NHS CYP transformation programme, which is where the epilepsy work sits. And my colleague Louise, who some of you will know, some of you don't, you'll hear from her a bit more later on, um, is the network lead for this uh, programme of work. Um, the sort of overriding factor in, in a lot of our work is the inequalities <clears throat> and poverty that we see within our region. So we know that there's huge inequalities in the young people that we serve. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and this cross cuts all of the work that we do and is a really important factor in our work. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the setup of the network began, as I say, in 2018. Um, we had some residential sessions, um, we had some um, day events like these pictures you can see here, wide engagement across the system with lots of professionals and lots of young people, which is fantastic. So that little picture you can see on the right there was some young people chairing one of our engagement sessions. So this, this uh, broad engagement helped us set our priorities way back in the day. And you can see here, this is our network priorities wheel. Somebody mute who's just come on there. Sorry. Sorry, I could hear myself coming back to myself. So these are our um, priorities here. So um, epilepsy fits within the childhood illness um, section, but also you can see how it would have an impact across the entire wheel of priorities there and some of the cross cutting themes as well. So all of the clinical priorities that we focus on have elements of these other priorities that factor into the work as well. Um, the population that we serve is huge um, and the proportion of young people um, you can see from this um, chart here this is age 0 to 17 but we take young people as being up to the age of 25 so you're looking at about 25 percent of the population as being um, the age group that we serve with the network. Um, the facts of life report if anybody's interested in learning a little bit more about the background of the network and um, the sort of reasons that we have the priorities that we do um, and some of the context for our work um, this lays it out. It takes um, some of the data from the Public Health England, um, as was uh, fingertips data, 
um, and lays it all out quite clearly by geography as well. So you can see where your area performs in some of these key metric areas and it doesn't look good for a lot of it, which gives us a lot of um, a lot of our priorities. Um, the network membership is now over 1700 um, across uh, the broad system. So we do have a large majority of, of people from health, but also from other sectors. You can see there education is a huge part. Um, local authority, VCSE are key partners for us. And then other is is anyone and anyone that you can think um, that might have a, um, uh, a relationship with working with children and young people. So we've got emergency services, we've got sports coaches, arts and culture is a huge thing for us, arts and well-being. So um, it's really broad membership. So if you aren't actually a member yet of the network, um, and this is the first you're hearing about us, um, there's links further up, further down the slide that you can use to, to join us. And I would really encourage you to, to make sure that you can link up with our work. And this is just a flavour of the work that we do through our active partnerships across the whole programme of work that we do. Um, and then just finally, this was linking back all the way to the start of the of the network. And we had Sir Al Ainsley Green, who was the first children's commissioner for the UK, um, who um, contributed quite a lot to our setup. Um, and this is just a quote from one of his books that we always share because it's just reminding us who we're here to advocate for and who our priorities should be. And it's the children themselves. So we have to be, be advocates for their best interests um, because nobody else will. So that's why we're here. Um, and we thank all of you for, for your engagement with our work. I'm going to hand over now to Jeff Lawson. Um, hopefully um, can see the slides. All right, you just tell me when to move on, Jeff. I know you've only got a couple of slides to go through, but um, I'm just going to let you introduce yourself and take us through the rest of the session. Are you there, Jeff? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Right. Hi. Uh, I can't see the. Have you put the, my slides up? Yeah, they should be there. If could people not see them before? We can see. I can't see yeah. my slides at the moment. How do I do that? I can see people's faces. Are they open in a different window? Yeah. Have you got two Teams windows open? No, I've only got one window open and it's got gallery or large gallery together mode to focus on content. Are you able to open them yourself at your end and just look at them? No, because I was I gave them to Louise. OK. It, you might need to come come out and come back in again. Would that be helpful and see if that resets it for you? I wouldn't, I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't risk coming out again. I'm okay. sorry. Chat. Oh, we, no. we, can, we can see your slide, Jeff, and the first one's Pilgrim's Progress, which we, we're, um, I don't know if that helps you speak to that. Yeah, uh, I don't think I, wait a minute, um, grief, grief, grief. So I can see all these people waiting to hear me say something irrelevant and I can't. I've been oh, there it is. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Sorry, right. Sorry, sorry, people. I, uh, I'm more familiar with Zoom than, than Teams. Um, so I'm going to very briefly um, give you a perspective on epilepsy in children. That is because um, I uh, was appointed in Sunderland in 1991 and therefore have got an experience of epilepsy um, through my consultant career. But I'll start about my medical student and my understanding of epilepsy as a medical student. This is quick. It was zero. I had no teaching on epilepsy whatsoever. It just wasn't mentioned. I qualified in 1977, and these were the only that were available. Uh, they were limited and, again, not really discussed in any great depth. As a junior doctor, I found that diabetes was my first love, and epilepsy remained a mystery. I wasn't really, apart from febrile convulsions that I'd see frequently, the consultants would see any child that had epilepsy, and so epilepsy remained a completely blank page for me. 
I became a consultant in Sunderland in 91, as I said, the three consultants, one neonatologist and two general pediatricians, and I was one of those general pediatricians. I was amazed when pharmaceutical representatives came to see me to tell about their new drug, uh, uh, and, and they would sh show me why I should be using it by saying how good their drug was compared with placebo. I must admit, I wondered whether or not I could invest in placebo because it seemed to be very effective. I could see the benefits of diabetes specialist nurses. Uh, and uh, um, because of that, I could see the potential benefits for epilepsy. And for that reason, in, the, uh, in about 1997, I started to, to, to try and bring together an epilepsy clinic and I tried to uh, um, uh, get an epilepsy nurse, which I did uh, for eight hours a week. But that was a start, a foot in the door, which helped me progress services for epilepsy. I went to a meeting in London uh, about epilepsy. And from that, uh, I was able to persuade the speakers to come to Sunderland to, to have an interactive epilepsy teaching session. In other words, not people just lecturing, but actually learning about epilepsy through asking questions. In the year 2000, I can hardly believe it, but I spoke at a, a, a Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health scientific meeting about the benefits of, of having a consultant with special expertise in epilepsy. Um, and I, I, really, in retrospect, 23 years ago, I shouldn't have been surprised. There was a huge amount of resistance because people regarded epilepsy as being part of the everyday uh, work for a general pediatrician, and it was taking the fun out of clinics if you took out the epilepsy patients they, thought, they felt. In 2001, there was a, a, something called a Leicester Inquiry, which you can look up if you wish, about pediatric epilepsy treatment because somebody who is not part of a network uh, started to, to do things which were a little, um, a little unusual, uh, leading to uh, children being uh, misdiagnosed and treated with too many anticonvulsants. From this, we, uh, uh, we were asked to, um, the, the, rather the British Pediatric Neurology Association was asked to develop a course for general pediatricians, and that's what uh, the Pediatric Epilepsy Training, which has, you see there in 2005, uh, why that emerged. In the meanwhile, in 2003, um, uh, the Pediatric Epilepsy Network for the Northeastern Cumbria was born, and I was vice chair for that. Network was an essential issue, which hopefully started to uh, um, uh, solve the problems of the Leicester inquiry. In 2007, I mentioned that my amazement at pharmaceutical representatives comparing their drug to placebo um, and the standard and new anticonvulsant drugs, one and then two. Uh, I contributed patients there and there for the first time, because previously uh, pharmaceutical companies didn't want to compare their drug against any of the standard drugs in case it didn't compare favorably. Well, this was an independently funded set of uh, investigations, which allowed us to realize which were the best anticonvulsants to use for children. Next slide. Next slide. Next, thank you. Uh, so we are getting there by embracing change. From the eight hours a day that I had for, for a, a specialist nurse in, in Sunderland, we, we got further funding and, and made that a full-time nurse. We have now consultants with an expertise in pediatric epilepsy. Uh, one of the uh, projects which will be mentioned are the Epilepsy 12 standards, which are, uh, has be, been taken on by the Royal College of Pediatrics Child Health to, to provide this audit to say how well we are doing in, in uh, diagnosing and managing children with epilepsy. And now, certainly in the northern region, we have a, a very healthy uh, network system with peer audit, where people who are providing epilepsy services will visit another um, uh, service to see how they're doing, what they're doing, partly to audit what they are doing, but also to learn from good practice. What are the next steps? To optimize clinical practice, as in the Epilepsy 12 standards, uh, and, and uh, we'll, this will be discussed uh, shortly. And, and very importantly, 
the mental health issues, including how to develop assessment tools to, to detect children who, because of epilepsy, have got cognitive problems, and to bridge the gap between health and education, where um, education where teachers will see children perhaps uh, once having developed epilepsy are, are not performing as well, and, and those links are going to be extremely important. And possibly most po um, important of all, uh, we need to start to listen to children and young people to get their understanding of not only of epilepsy, but the effects that it has on their mental health and well-being and their cognition at school. Thank you. I think we're now going to uh, move on to Anita Devlin, who uh, I, I knew uh, even when she was a senior registrar. Uh, she has continued to work uh, a lot in the area of, of, of epilepsy. She uh, is the person to whom we would refer children to consider epilepsy surgery. Uh, I'd like her to continue to, to th this meeting by speaking to the national position on epilepsy in children and young people. Thank you, Anita. Thanks very much, Jeff, and thanks for giving us such a great context to the history of the evolution of uh, the structure of epilepsy uh, services for children and young people. I thought I would just give a very brief overview of the national context and how it arose and the various timelines. Um, I'm a paediatric neurologist at the Great North Children's Hospital, but also the um, uh, epilepsy advisor for children and young people to the northeastern Yorkshire. And I've been chairing, co-chairing one of the national work streams. Next slide, please. So um, the long term plan, the NHS long term plan um, makes a commitment towards improving the care of children and young people with long term conditions. And the three conditions that were prioritised for service improvement were or are asthma, epilepsy and diabetes. Now, asthma was the first to be initi initiated with uh, quite a significant amount of resource. Epilepsy began with a first national meeting in 2021, uh, a little behind that. And diabetes has always had strong networks and resources on which they're building currently. Um, a national oversight group for epilepsy was established in 2021 with representation from Young Epilepsy, which is the only national charity um, dedicated to children and young people. Uh, the organisation of paediatric epilepsy networks, open representation from the Epilepsy 12 audit and the NHS England Paediatric Neurosciences Clinical Reference Group. Next slide, please. And the purpose of the oversight group was to provide the governance um, for the initiatives to improve the care and the outcomes. It was co-chaired with Young Epilepsy so that the voice of children and young people would be at the core of what was developed. Um, the purpose was to agree a jointly agreed programme of work informed by the best available evidence, which we had from Epilepsy 12. A regional infrastructure was also established um, with NHS England regional clinical leads um, now all appointed to influence the system delivery um, of the programme. And um, regional leadership groups, obviously with ICB representation, have also been established now. Um, so there is quite a considerable structure ready for implementation. Next, try, next slide, please. So the four key areas for improvement that were identified um, were mental health, access to tertiary services, including surgery, transition from paediatric to adult services and variations in epilepsy care. Um, and I've put little annotations on the side in terms of some of the problems that uh, are being encountered in these four themed areas, which is why when the um, analysis of the Epilepsy 12 audit data was undertaken, these four um, themes or areas were identified as being areas of focus. And on that basis, we um, developed four national work stream groups um, that would work intensively on developing um, outcomes and deliverables. Next slide, please. 
So just a brief overview of the timeline, you can see that in June to December, there were some initial sessions agreeing the scope and the themes for work. In 2022, there were an intense period uh, of uh, monthly work stream meetings in each of the four work streams to develop the deliverables. Some of you may be familiar with this approach from the asthma uh, bundles that were developed. Um, February, uh, where we are approximately now, we have a set of proposed recommendations and standards which are going to be released for consultation and the agreed deliverables for delivery will be out for uh, in April 2023 with an implementation phase moving forward from then. Next slide, please. You can already see uh, the map uh, that's been shown to you before of the region that we are covering. There are four ICSs within the North Eastern Yorkshire, and you can also see the list of the uh, trusts that fall within those different ICSs. Next slide, please. And the, you know, what's the purpose of the regional leadership team? Well, we've established a regional leadership team um, with responsibility for epilepsy care within those four ICSs. The Epilepsy 12 team have produced data for us at regional and ICB footprint level. Uh, and whilst the deliverables have been under development, it's given the opportunity for each um, ICB to examine their own data, undertake some mapping and some gap analysis uh, uh, in their own services, to understand the variation in service delivery and pathways that exist uh, by reviewing commissioning arrangements, looking at the availability of mental health support, looking at re referral pathways and transition, so that they're now in a state of readiness to receive the, the deliverables and the bundle, if, if you will. Um, so that was all good uh, and excellent background work supported by Epilepsy 12. Um, there is a, um, an emphasis on co-production with children and young people and families, which is very important. And Young Epilepsy have a national network of ambassadors who they're very willing to put you in touch with. So please be aware of that resource uh, and contact Young Epilepsy if you wish them to become involved in any advocacy elements of what you're doing. I would highly recommend that. And we also have a commitment between the four ICBs to share good practice across the region um, through our meetings and also through the epilepsy networks, PENEC, as Jeff was saying, and the equivalent, which is YPEN, the Yorkshire Pediatric Epilepsy Network. So that is work that is currently underway and will be underway in the coming couple of years. So that's the end, I think, of the national update. Just to say that um, the ICB leads for North East and North Cumbria are Ramesh Kumar, who is on this call and presenting project one later on, and Louise Dauncey, who you've all already met. Um, and this piece of work couldn't have taken place, that these projects that we're about to present, without the foresight of the Child Health and Wellbeing Network, who were willing to um, put resource into scoping um, and uh, analysing the gaps we already had in readiness for uh, service improvement for epilepsy. So a big thank you to the Child Health and Wellbeing Network. Right, I think we're moving on now to uh, Epilepsy Project 2. Um, and this project uh, was about exploring the mental health and psychological support approaches, availability and gaps for our children with young people um, uh, with epilepsy in the Northeast and North Cumbria. And I'm delighted to say that it has been a multidisciplinary approach to this project and all of the named people that you can see on that slide who are responsible for different specialist areas are here this morning and will present their um, own top five findings and top five recommendations. Next slide, please. We had um, aims to, um, as, as described there, to scope it out and identify gaps, but also to start to suggest recommendations which were locality, relevant to locality that we're in, uh, and to agree a common vision across the different uh, disciplines that we had involved in this project through consultation and feedback. 
um, and to establish uh, thereafter an interdisciplinary Northeastern North Cumbria Alliance group, which would be crucial in terms of having things in place for the implementation phase. It's all very good to do the, the talking and the planning, but if you don't have implementation structure, that is where most projects will fail. Next slide, please. I mean, a short, uh, there is an extensive method section in the full report, and I've given you the link for the full report at the bottom, and I'm sure um, Jen uh, and Louise would be able to put that in the chat for you if you were interested. Um, but essentially it involved engagement with practitioners from education, secondary care, primary care and mental health services, as well as engagement with parents and carers and children and young people to get qualitative and quantitative information about current approaches to mental health problems. There was co-design of online surveys for each professional group and advice was sought from YPAG Northeast uh, and also Young Epilepsy about co-producing consent processes and materials for engaging with children and young people and their families. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to hand over to Kate Swaddle, who can introduce herself and give us uh, her highlights from the findings from education. Over to you, Kate. Thank you so much, Anita. And um, thanks to Louise there for just putting the link to the report um, in the chat because um, I reread it all last night and it's 97 pages worth of hugely um, quality information. And just, you know, revisiting it, I just thought it was really worthwhile to say, please, 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 you know, read the full report because there's such valuable information there that I think is just worth not a cursory glance, but a real sit down um, and thorough um, analysis of it. So in terms of my role, I'm an executive head teacher. Um, I used to work in North Tyneside, I'm now working in Gateshead and I was education advisor to the network and um, co-produced the education aspect um, with the, the multidisciplinary team that Anita's highlighted. Can we just move on to the um, summary please, thanks. So in terms of the survey that we put out to schools, um, I, I'll just quickly give a bit brief background to it. So we send a survey out to schools via um, lots of um, distribution methods um, and we, it's probably very representative of the, the um, cohorts that we've got. So we had mainstream settings, we had send schools, we had all through provisions, and um, we had some arms units or ARP units, depending on which region they were. And we also had a middle school and secondary school responding. And it was fair to say that we think that this would be fairly typical of um, epilepsy cohorts, both in primary, secondary and send provisions. Um, so we think we've got a fair um, understanding of what epilepsy looks like across the region. Just move on, thanks. So I'm going to talk about five findings and five recommendations, um, but this slide in particular underpins all of those findings, recommendations, and I just thought it was really worth highlighting this first. So in an education setting, one of the things we really need to think about is who is responsible for the information that we hold, where is the diagnosis of epilepsy recorded, and who holds those clinic letters, because without that information, the rest of this project really falls down. Um, only 28% of schools said that they had individual healthcare plans issued by the NHS. So that kind of gives you a bit of background as to where education settings are. Um, some of them are in the dark. Some of them have probably haven't got the right communication arms into the NHS. Um, and less than half said that they had received contributions towards annual reviews of individual healthcare plans from an epilepsy support network. So that's just to give you some background contextual information. We just move on. The first two findings, um, and, and I'm, I'm conscious that this is quite quick, but the first two findings, the, the first one was really, really paramount. 85% of schools felt that parents and carers are not an adequate source of all health information for children and people with epilepsy. Some of it self-reported, some of it was a lack of communication, but that was a really, really pertinent finding for us. Finding number two, 76% of schools report that further staff training is required with regard to identification of an intervention for mental health and cognitive problems in children and people with epilepsy. And that then really does need to be some kind of training and agreed tools and approaches um, for nominated members of staff to have a really good depth and breadth of knowledge for children and young people with epilepsy. OK, we'll just move on. Finding number three. So regardless of 59 percent of schools recognising that children and young people with epilepsy are more likely to have cognitive problems, 
85% of settings don't have a specific screening algorithm or assessment protocol for those children and people. And that could be for various reasons. It could be, you know, setting dependent, but it was just worthwhile bringing that to the attention of the group here today. Moving on. So finding number four, only 27% of schools actively screen for mental health problems in children, young people with epilepsy. And the screening undertaken was quite varied and did not necessarily employ a validated tool or approach. Um, and considering that this project was focused around mental health support, we thought that was a quite startling statistic. Move on to finding five. Um, and this one was quite interesting because it was all about the onward referral um, system to, to really help support those children, young people with epilepsy. So respondents identified that CAMS or SIPS would be the first protocol if they did have mental health difficulties, a clinical or educational psychologist, 58%, and counselling support were kind of the main onward referral routes. But interestingly, two thirds of schools said that they would likely refer to a public health school nurse. And we know that that's really varied across the region, um, depending on local authorities, depending on commissioning, et cetera. Um, but it was interesting that schools still seem to think that that was a really valuable resource. If we just move on to the recommendations, thanks so much. So um, recommendation number one, for optimal care, there needs to be open lines of communication between education settings and secondary and tertiary care for children and people with epilepsy. And I think as an education setting, it can be quite isolating unless you've got a really good link into your um, epilepsy support network. Um, and I think, you know, education settings are quite reluctant to pick up the phone sometimes because they think, oh, you know, um, that's the NHS with separate systems. But it's really important that we um, consider this as a really um, important line of communication. So in terms of recommendation two, um, one of the things that schools often do, you know, we, we and particularly for um, earlier settings, have to have people who are paediatric first aid trained and accredited. But we basically think that education settings should know more about and access specialist training providers where, um, you know, we've got the um, tertiary settings um, delivering paediatric epilepsy training or young epilepsy training where the course is specific to epilepsy. It's not just part of a broader picture because we do know that the specifics of this are really important. Move on. And then recommendation three and four come hand in hand with one another where we solely focus on mental health. So children and people with epilepsy should be signposted to a senior mental health lead in school as a designated point of contact. Now we know that this has to be age appropriate. We know that as the child grows and their experience of um, emotional understanding grows, um, that, that you know they will become more familiar with that person as time moves on. However, it's important that they know who to approach in the school setting who can help them with any difficulties around their epilepsy. And then if we just move on to the next slide, the next slide really shows us that if they have good signposting from that senior mental health lead, they can access a real suite of interventions within the education settings. But what was interesting is that this wasn't necessarily standardised. Um, depending on school resources, um, staffing capabilities, etc., the interventions were really quite wide and varied. So one of the recommendations that we think is really important is to try and standardise this to say, actually, these are evidence based, these interventions work, and we think these are the best protocol for this um, child or young person. Now, as we move on to recommendation four, the um, education mental health practitioner role has really taken off, um, you know, nationally. And in this region in particular, I think we've really embraced it. And we know that epilepsy is a chronic condition and its impact on children and young people may fluctuate. We know that they might have exacerbations where their mental health and wellbeing might take a dip. But we also know that there are times where it's OK. But we recognise that the education mental health practitioner role is quite um, relevant for short acute conditions where short, imp um, short intervention can really help overcome their difficulties. But we also appreciate that sometimes that can be limiting, particularly for a child with a chronic condition. So we really need to think about how we're going to use and embrace those education mental health practitioners um, in this package of support for children and people with epilepsy. And then our last recommendation is just to remember, and um, I know Jeff alluded to it in the introduction, particular attention should be paid to cognitive screening for children and young people with epilepsy and as a consequence, their response to intervention. Because we ultimately know that if the child has a decrease in attainment, a decrease in progress, um, they have low self-esteem, they have low self-confidence, then that will ultimately impact on their mental health and well-being. 
So from our point of view, we really need to recognise that if they've got low attainment, that can have additional consequences of social, emotional and mental health difficulties. And we really need to be alert to that in education settings. And then just to end bit by basically saying this, this quote came from one of the, the survey feedback um, summaries and it came from an educator and I just thought it was really poignant to sh share with you. So a child and young person with epilepsy needs to understand their condition and have access to an expert in school who can support their needs, who understands epilepsy holistically, not just from a mental health point of view, but from a medical perspective also, i.e. understanding how and why epilepsy causes the difficulties it does. So I'll leave it there, but thanks very much for listening. And if you've got any questions, I'm happy to answer them in the chat. Thank you very much, Kate, um, for uh, summarising that so well for us. Um, I'm moving on now to talk about the findings and recommendations from the hospital based secondary care part of the um, piece of work. Next slide, please. So we distributed our survey to epilepsy specialist nurses and clinical leads who were the paediatricians with expertise in epilepsy that Jeff was referring to on his introduction. And as expected, we had an excellent response rate from epilepsy specialist nurses who were a very committed, passionate group of people. Um, so that was great uh, that we got their input into it and a, a good response rate from the clinical leads. Next slide, please. So the first finding was that a validated tool to screen for mental health difficulties is not used in epilepsy clinics for children and young people anywhere in the ICB or across other settings. Next slide, please. Finding two was that there was no availability of mental health professional input to the epilepsy clinics across the ICS. It's noteworthy that this is available for other health conditions such as diabetes and has been for many, many years. Um, embedded health psychology within the clinic was the model that most of the epilepsy specialist nurses and paediatricians uh, favoured in their feedback to meet the needs of the children and young people, but also to offer recognition and risk assessment of the mental health problems in carers and parents, which is often overlooked. Next slide, please. Finding three was that um, six out of ten of the nurses reported that they felt they were expected to offer the mental health support, which they also thought was outside their experience and expertise. And six out of nine of the paediatricians also reported the same. It's not acceptable to expect colleagues to carry and manage the risk of mental health needs. Um, while the child and young person waits on a long waiting list elsewhere for an assessment and access to intervention. Epilepsy specialist nurses said that the first level of mental health support to the children and young people and their families could be part of their role, but that would need a significant increase in specialist nurse resource, training and supervision. Next slide, please. Finding four was that there was a lack of partnership working between education, mental health practitioner teams, special educational needs coordinators and hospital based clinical teams. And further training is being requested by all prof professional groups, um, which is interesting, covering the recognition, support and onward referral of children and young people with epilepsy and mental health needs. Next slide, please. There were no epilepsy support groups uh, across the ICS footprint for children and young people and separately for their families. And there were no specific group mental health interventions across the ICS footprint. Next slide, please. So recommendation one was to agree a selection of validated tools, as Kate was alluding to previously, to screen for mental health problems suitable to be used across different contexts uh, of the child and young person's life. And the example Kate showed was the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. And that's just one example of a tool that could be used across contexts. Training would need to be given in the use of these tools, um, but it allows you to develop a tiered, tiered approaches to onward referral pathways, depending on the level of need indicated by your screening tool. Next slide, please. So recommendation two um, was uh, the involvement of uh, hospital based trained mental health professionals in the assessment of children, young people and their families, selection of the tiered interventions, 
support and supervision of other professional groups in assessing and intervening, uh, and the development of onward referral pathways and the involvement of, of uh, psychologists uh, and hospital based trained mental health professionals is very important to give this um, not just the services to the children and young people, but the support and education to the rest of the multidisciplinary group. Next slide, please. Recommendation three is that the number of epilepsy specialist nurses for children and young people should be increased to achieve equity of access across our ICS footprint and to allow epilepsy specialist nurse attendance at all the clinics, which is not the case currently. So there is a hugely missed opportunity for an interaction with the child and young person and their family by not having that resource available in the clinic. The first level of the mental health support to children and young people could be part of their role. However, as previously alluded to, there would need to be a significant increase in this resource uh, along with appropriate training. Next slide, please. Better communication between the professional groups across all the contexts and services within a child and young person's life is required to offer this staged but also integrated approach to the recognition and intervention for their mental health needs. Working in partnership also offers the opportunity for a more timely and effective intervention, which avoids the excessive delays that we're currently seeing for children and young people who are in need of mental health support. Next slide, please. And the final recommendation was to set up support groups for children and young people with epilepsy and their families in the locality. Uh, to consider the delivery of group interventions, which have an evidence base, uh, it's called the PIE intervention, as well as one to one interventions to address these needs. Supervised, as I said previously, by trained mental health professionals so that appropriate escalation of concerns and interventions can be made as appropriate. And to facilitate the involvement of children and young people in their families in the co-design of the services for them which incorporate assessment and intervention for mental health issues. Next slide, please. I'm delighted now to introduce um, Dr. Vashali Nanda, who can uh, tell us more about her role uh, and the recommendations and findings from primary care. Over to you, Vashali. Thanks, Anita. I think the previous speakers have uh, led me nicely into my few slides, which I'm going to present. So I'd probably pick up on what Dr. Lawson uh, said earlier about epilepsy being a mystery, and I would absolutely echo that. I mean, I think maybe that was in your junior doctor days, Dr. Lawson. I'm in 2023 and it's still a mystery. Something which Kate uh, said earlier about parents and carers not being an adequate source of information, I'll add another aspect to it. Primary care um, is another, uh, you know, source which it doesn't understand epilepsy that well. I'm not undermining my primary care colleagues. It's just a breadth of knowledge. Our knowledge is very uh, uh, wide, but we can't really become an expert in every subject. So it's literally, uh, for want of a better phrase, blind leading the blind. So we do need good access to you know, support and resources. It's very difficult for uh, patients and families to na navigate the path. and they do come to primary care a lot with problems so we need to kind of understand um when uh, anita and louise involved me in this project um, i did say uh, oh my god another survey there's no time in primary care to fill the survey and there were lots of questions but it tested my ignorance and i'm humble enough to admit that i've been a gp since 2015 20, not 2015, lot, 2005, uh, been a GP now for 18 years. And I've never actually recognized that most of our quality initiatives, which we do in primary care, are very adult centric. One of the questions was, could I tell without uh, really searching our systems, how many patients of epilepsy do we have under 18? And I couldn't. And then when I did go looking, um, as part of a quality out work framework, we are supposed to keep register for various diseases. We do keep a register for epilepsy patients, but that's above 18. So if I don't know how many children I have in my practice, which is a list size of about 8,000, 
how am I going to provide care to them and care to their family? We've already recognized that carers need support. Uh, so one of my findings was that there isn't a requirement for primary care to maintain a register. And as I said, all the quality initiatives are very adult centric. The survey also reflected, um, despite the response wasn't great, and there could be various reasons for it. Number one, they don't understand epilepsy, so immediately the survey will perhaps go into the bin. But those who have filled it, they did say that they do have a desire and willingness to, you know, learn more about epilepsy. It doesn't mean that they want to become experts, and we should interpret that with caution, but they do need the support. It reflects the lack of confidence which we all have in primary care around dealing with such conditions. And we really don't know the referral pathways from primary care. I think, Kate, earlier you mentioned about um, kind of uh, having, uh, if these children need assessment for their cognitive assessment or how they are progressing in school. When they come to us that my child is not progressing in school, I, I really don't know where to refer them. So that we need to um, have clear pathways about the medical pathway, but also about the social aspect and other aspects. So these were my brief findings really from primary care, that whilst there is ignorance, we have the desire to learn really. Uh, next slide, please. So I've already mentioned that I think what we want is easy access to resources. We have clinical systems in primary care which are really clever and I've worked uh, with one of my consultant colleagues in James Cook before and we picked up top five conditions and those referral pathways are on our system and these are easy access because once we are in a busy surgery we really don't have time to go looking for guidelines. Uh, we need responsive advice and guidance service and access to telephone advice. Another work which I've been involved in, James Cook, is the telephone triage line. And that's really helpful because not all children need admitting, but if I can get advice if somebody comes to me, that is really helpful. I would say that I think there should be some requirement for primary care to maintain a register of patients with epilepsy. So we can recognize these patients. It will also give us opportunity to register the families as carers so they can be given appropriate support. It could mean giving easy access to appointments or, you know, even checking on them if they need any support, like with their mental health or their well-being, really. Um, I think earlier there was mention about the education mental health practitioner. Now, practices working at primary care network level, like a group of practices working together, have the ability to recruit additional roles. And we've recruited a mental health practitioner through uh, working with a mental health trust, but again, very adult centric. We have got physiotherapists, we've got um, care coordinators, social prescribers. I think this focus really needs to shift to under 18 years. So we are providing a holistic care to our future adult population. I think that was my slides. Thank you. I'll pass over to Dr. Chloe Geegan, please. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hopefully you can see me OK. Um, my name is Chloe Gagan. I am currently based at the Centre for Life in Newcastle as a paediatric clinical psychologist, but I also work on the psychology adding value in epilepsy uh, screening programme in NHS Lothian, which is one of the health boards in NHS Scotland. Um, first slide, please. Um, so Anita briefly introduced around the methods. We um, followed a similar kind of line when we were exploring um, the views of mental health professionals within this project. However, there were a couple of extra steps. So um, first of all, we actually had to uh, map the mental health services in the region to begin with, um, because it was quite telling that it was not that easy to find who to send the survey to. Um, so we kind of did it in, a, in the first stage to explore the services that are currently available um, before you know, similar to other work streams, sending out surveys that were shared with professionals in these services. So they're explore, exploring service specific questions related to resources, staffing, care pathways, 
specific questions about epilepsy, but also trying to identify gaps and um, pathways for future work. In total, um, 11 professionals completed the online survey out of around 88 invites. So it was a response rate of only around 13 um, percent. And out of that, uh, those 11 responses, we had four different health settings represented. So we had general uh, child and adolescent mental health services. We also had child and adolescent mental health learning disability uh, service, health psychology and also neuropsychology. Um, respondents were based in a variety of regions as well. However, just being mindful that obviously response rates were low, so we just need to be a little bit cautious when trying to interpret any of our uh, findings for this uh, part of the project. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we also were very keen, um, as kind of has been mentioned already, to get um, parents and young people themselves themselves involved. Um, so as Anita mentioned, we first of all saw uh, some advice from um, YPAG, which is one of the local advisory groups based at the Great North Children's Hospital, around consent processes, information sheets, how to get young people engaged. Um, and we also approached Young Epilepsy as well to discuss the possibility of some of the young reps becoming involved and also just to hear about how they find kind of focus groups and um, youth involvement, how, how that kind of works for them. Um, so young reps are individuals with epilepsy who contribute to campaigns to improve daily life um, for individuals with epilepsy by sharing their own stories and giving their own views on projects. Um, so we received responses from two young reps who helped to formulate the, the questionnaires uh, that we use for the focus groups and for the interviews. Um, and then we also um, approached the epilepsy specialist nurses in the region and asked them to identify at least two families on their caseload who might be able to meet the eligibility uh, for the project. Um, so these were children, young people aged between 12 and 17 years of age with epilepsy and no identified learning disability. Um, so they were um, deemed as eligible and so were their parents or caregivers. Next slide, please. Um, so from the, the first kind of step around the service mapping, um, we weren't able within this project to actually explore what exactly is being offered within each mental health team. Um, so it was it was unclear whether these services do liaise regularly with medical teams, educational professionals, alongside offering like what it is they offer as an individual work, group work, family therapy, etc. Um, there was also variation in services available across the region. Um, so for example, in Cumbria, there's actually health psychology service, but it's limited to what physical health conditions are, are being seen. So uh, children and young people with epilepsy aren't seen within, within the health psychology team in Cumbria. Um, next slide, please. Um, within the mental health professionals responses, so as we said, um, there's actually a combination of some good areas of practice, but also quite a lot of um, service gaps that were getting flagged up. So the ma majority of respondents were aware, um, thankfully, of higher rates of mental health and cognitive difficulties in young people with epilepsy. However, a lot of them stated that less than a quarter of their team had received specific epilepsy training. Um, next slide, please. Um, within from um, a parents and young person point of view. So parents felt like conversations about mental health uh, were not routine within epilepsy clinics. There was limited involvement of children, young people and families in service evaluation and improvement. And there was limited opportunities for peer support groups as well. Next slide, please. Um, so I right, just thought this was quite um, uh, a useful quote that one of the young reps provided as well. So mental health is something that most young people know too much about. Not, from, uh, not just from personal experiences, constant bombardment at school or college with leaflets, assemblies, same basic and outdated information. But when you actually need the help, it's never accessible. And that's just something that we thought kind of was getting flagged quite a bit throughout this whole project of this is something we know about. We know this is a need within this population, but it's how do we actually access that support when, when we get to that point? Next slide, please. So from our recommendations point of view, um, we would recommend that interventions for children and young people with epilepsy should be staged and integrated so that as far as possible, parents have access to a team who are able to monitor their child's epilepsy and then they're able to access and support mental health while addressing cognitive concerns throughout the, the kind of de developmental stages. Next um, slide, please. Um, there also should be increased communication between mental health services, education and health services. Um, one way in doing this as well is also actually just having a list of what is available within the region of all the mental health services or, you know, be it within the NHS, but also, you know, third sector as well um, and keeping that list up to date. 
as well as identifying a member of staff um, who is responsible for, I suppose, that care coordination side of things, the link between education and also the health professionals. Next slide, please. Um, further training as in other projects has also been identified as an area of need, but specifically within the mental health side, it was flagged up um, that it would be particularly helpful within your your developmental assessment pathway. So within the child and adolescent mental health services, um, when a young person with epilepsy is referred for an autism assessment or ADHD assessment, which we know is there's higher rates of these conditions within young people with epilepsy, how important it is for clinicians within those teams to recognise the impact epilepsy might have on a young person's presentation. Um, next slide, please. Um, so with regards to engagement with parents and carers and children and young people with epilepsy, so within this project we had um, a group of parents, I think there was around four parents in total, we actually only ended up having one young person with epilepsy take part, which was a bit of a shame, but we did that as more of a one-to-one -one interview rather than a focus group um, for that young person. However, findings from this stream um, identified that parents should have better access to better information at diagnosis, potentially, at around mental health, uh, how mental health and epilepsy may affect their child. Um, kind of touching on the idea of actually parents themselves need support as well. It's, you know, it's a difficult situation. Things change, different points, um, you know, transition stages and all that kind of thing. Um, having parents themselves having access to support is something that we feel like would be quite important. Um, increased involvement of children, young people and their families in service development. So within this project, it was um, quite difficult to get done within the time frame, which again was a shame, but just having that actually from from the offset, having that idea of getting young people involved and their parents and caregivers involved, I think would just shape every project. And we're really listening to people then as well. Um, so the, the final point was also just start early, ensure there's enough time for this to happen in any service development project going forward. Um, and I believe that's the end and I'll pass back to uh, Anita. So very briefly, uh, I think in conclusion, I hope you can all see that there's some common themes that emerged across uh, these various different uh, professional groups, which were really interesting to, to see. Um, mostly the mental health needs of children and young people with epilepsy were acknowledged by they were aware of them and they were acknowledged by all of the groups, but there were no consistent screening tools and interventions used to try to identify uh, and then both intervene um, at, for that child and young person. Additional training was required was requested by everybody that we spoke to in terms of the effects of epilepsy on mental health, cognition, interventions and and subsequent referral pathways. Better communication was requested by all groups across the different contexts and services for the child and young person and an integrated approach which would avoid these excessive delays. Um, closer involvement of trained mental health professionals in assessment and intervention was um, requested by all groups and better identification identification of these children and young people in each setting, as um, uh, Dr Nanda was saying in terms of primary care, but also within education and mental health services. And also consultation and involvement with children and young people and families themselves regarding the service requirements and co-production of these changes uh, for their services was also a common theme. Next slide, please. So I think that concludes the Epilepsy uh, 2 project in mental health. And I'd now like to hand back to um, Jeff as chair to take you forward for the next project. Thank you, Anita, and all of your contributors. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Ramesh Kumar is going to speak about the Epilepsy 12 uh, audit data. Uh, and uh, then we have a short break after that. So, uh, Ramesh, over to you. Thank you, Jeff, for th and thank you, Anita, for presenting your project too. Um, I'm a consultant pediatrician working at South Tees, and I have seen growth of epilepsy service in our centre. Uh, I joined in 2007, and uh, it's been an excellent experience doing that thing, and that experience has helped me to complete uh, the project one, which obviously helped with the Lewis and the other uh, members and, and the leads from the different service across the region. 
I'm also the cl clinical epilepsy lead, so obviously uh, taking the outcome and the recommendation from these projects forward will be one of the piece of work I'll be doing this year with help of uh, the network. Next slide, please. We have so far talked about uh, one of the important comorbidity of epilepsy in young people. This is mental health, but also uh, it's important that we are talking about epilepsy today and it is uh, most common chronic neurological disorder which is present in children and and most of the time the children present with the recurrent seizures and epilepsy has no age no racial geographical or socioeconomic boundaries so it it is present across all the uh, demographics which are present in the in the community so it is important that the different aspect of epilepsy care are also addressed through these ones which probably will be will highlighted in a different presentation in in the in the today Interestingly, we don't know across the country that how many children are there with epilepsy. There is an estimate coming from the different sources, but we don't know. And it is it is important that when we talk about improving epilepsy care, it is important to know exact number and something which will be uh, which is at the national level is work is going on and hopefully will have will know more clearly about those group of children. But at the moment, what we know that there are 50 children per 100,000 population or children between 0 to 18. And the long term plan, NHS plan, which has been alluded previously in, in Anita's talk, is to create clinical networks to improve the quality of care of children with epilepsy. And, and this is an important aspect because epilepsy is not only with the child, it also affects the winder families also, and there is a wider implication of epilepsy on the child education and the well-being. So it is important that as a network, we address all the different aspects of the care. Next slide, please. Very briefly about NICE guidance, which has produced the quality standards, which are uh, been updated in 2020. And if somebody wants to read through that, it will be helpful to understand what are the different standards required. And Epilepsy 12 is a national audit program which has been mentioned uh, in different uh, presentation. And, and these, uh, uh, this audit is basically helping in uh, maintaining the quality of care across the, across the different services and the trust in, in, the, in the country. Next slide, please. Child Health and Wellbeing Network has been uh, supported, These both the project, Project 1 and Project 2, and they're also supporting the delivery of a transformation agenda, which is a national agenda across the Northeast North Cumbria region. So I'm very, I'm very thankful for the network supporting this piece of work, uh, which will be very helpful uh, to, to improve the care of the children with epilepsy. There are eight trust or eight services across the region which provide the epilepsy care to the young people. Next slide, please. As uh, Jeff mentioned about uh, the origin of network of we call Panic Network in 2003, and this network has been operating. And it is, uh, I think we are lucky that all the services are the members of this network across the Northeast North Cumbria ICS boundaries. And it also has, uh, it oversees and helps the different services uh, to, to share the good practices and also how the services can be improved or the care can be improved. Next slide, please. This is uh, uh, was an exercise which was done as a part of the project to know exactly estimate how many children are in our region uh, could be with epilepsy. And based on that, as you can see, uh, this slide shows, and this is the estimate only, we don't know exact numbers, but these are estimate which was calculated uh, to understand what is the incidence and prevalence of epilepsy across the region and how we can address those issues. Next slide, please. If you look into the metrics of uh, epilepsy care uh, uh, through the NSS, uh, sorry, NICE guidance or through the epilepsy 12, there are many aspects out there. But what I feel there are five P's in epilepsy care, which are very, very important. And we those metrics can be divided into the first matrix, which is uh, the first group is a patient. Uh, the patient wants a center, uh, wants to be a center of care, personalized care and important that all the clinical needs are met. Second group is parents who wants the child to be treated by the uh, team which has appropriate skills and training. Pediatrician and pediatric neurologist wants appropriate training and adequate time to run the service. 
pediatric epilepsy nurses wants appropriate training and again educated time, but they are the important aspect of uh, the care. Primary care and policymakers are equally important in to providing the continuity of care and also providing resources. So if you look into the epilepsy care, there are five or six P's which can be which important play. And next slide. And all these P's are interrelated. So we have to work collaboratively to improve the care of epilepsy across the region by working together. And I'm sure this will be reflected in different talks which have been uh, presented today. Next slide, please. So the project one, as I said, commissioned by the network, and the important thing was about to review a scoping exercise of the services across the region and also uh, compare the outcome with epilepsy 12 indicators. Next slide, please. The aims and objectives were very, uh, 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 was multifaceted, but all aligning with the priorities of the network and also NHS long-term plan. Um, we know the standards are there, but how effective those standards are being delivered by the different services. And our broad aim was to have a common vision based on NHS long-term plan to review and consolidate the pathways across the primary care, secondary and tertiary care, and looking into the good practices across the epilepsy services across the region, and also identify the variation and health inequalities in the in in this exercise so that we a recommendation can be made and 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 the progress can be made in improving the service in addition to this one it was important to have in-depth baseline report about the delivery of epilepsy care across the region focusing on the diagnosis referral pathways care and treatment medication support in schools staffing resources transition to adult epilepsy services working closely with the primary secondary and tertiary care and also including the wider stakeholders, which includes education partners, which has been <coughs> highlighted uh, by the by the Kate and, and Chloe's talks. Next slide, please. Again, it's a busy slide and showing basically the uh, in, uh, into our aims was to uh, look into experience of young people and their families from the epilepsy care point of view, look into what is experience of uh, education system, navigating through the care pathways, consistency into the care system across the region, and also having a very good communication and working relation between primary, secondary and tertiary care. We also looked into commissioning arrangements, what is the availability of the mental health support, which has been presented in uh, uh, by Anita, what are the different pathways across the primary, uh, no, secondary care and the tertiary services across the region to improve the epilepsy surgeries, and what is the transition mechanism which is present across the region. Next slide. Uh, so we have managed to create, a, aim was to create a useful resource which people can refer, which uh, Luz has been put, the report has been put across in, into the chat box, which people can access, and also to send this report to the wider system and the colleagues so that uh, we can work together to improve the epilepsy service and the care across the region. Also, looking into reducing the health inequalities across the region, which is important aspect because there are, uh, we know that this uh, Northeast North Cumbria is one of the deprived area and has uh, people coming from, from low social status. Thank you. Next slide, please. So methodology wise, uh, uh, we uh, we were lucky that all the services uh, participated in the into this project, which was undertaken between October 21 to March 2022, and uh, it was important to to do the mapping exercise. We involved uh, all the clinical leads from eight services, and we have uh, uh, interview, and the data was put into uh, into uh, Microsoft uh, program, which we, we collated. Uh, I'll, I'll go to the next slide also. Next slide, please. So the targeted meeting happened between colleagues from education, primary care, secondary care, and the tertiary care. All the findings were uh, put into Microsoft forms and the information was collated together. Semi-structure interview also done with all the epilepsy nurses by Helen Gilpin, who's been part of this uh, project. And, uh, and uh, we collected all this information together uh, and, and put in the report. Next slide, please. 
And so now we are coming to the finding of this project and the main finding will be divided into three. One is education setting, second is uh, uh, primary care, and third is about the services. And, and uh, education setting showed range of information from education setting was collated about the care management and support of young people into, uh, into the cross. As already mentioned previously, there were 28 responses given by 15 local authorities. Next slide, please. 96% of the school confirmed that they have recorded the presence of epilepsy as a diagnosis of the main illness on the school's central information management system. At the time of survey, 18 of the 28 settings reported that they currently had one or more young person with epilepsy on roll. 75% of the respondents indicated that individual healthcare plans were in place but needs updated uh, once a year. And 75% of the settings are currently supported or have in five years by the epilepsy nurses in relation to the children's care. Next slide, please. 75% of the respondent also indicated that some school staff have received specific epilepsy training, but there's a big gap into the training uh, of, of the staff. In most cases, this training was provided by the epilepsy nurses coming from the aid services. However, this can be looked into that how that can be improved in the future. Next slide, please. This survey has highlighted the variation in the support received by the adjacent settings, and there are gaps into, into that one, and our aim would be how to support education setting and how can that be improved as uh, uh, part of this, this project has to be taken forward. Next slide. Coming to the primary care, as Vesali Nanda was a, a part of this project, and she has alluded into her slide uh, into the project too, and it is the same that there's a variation and the lack of clarity about, about the referral pathways into the secondary care. And that needs consolidation in, 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 in uh, uh, this year on uh, to work closely with the primary care. Obviously, improving the education, training, and practical support from the primary care colleagues when they are looking after the patient with, uh, with epilepsy. Also improving the GPs to manage cases that have been discharged by epilepsy secondary services and how can they forward. Also involving uh, primary care into the transition of young people uh, into the adult services. We also looking into how the we can enhance the mechanism to improve the education and understanding of families with, the, with, the, with epilepsy. And also improving the confidence of parents into the primary care uh, 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 when they have issues which uh, can be dealt in the primary care. Next slide, please. So I think the aim is to, to develop an interspecialty referral mechanism to address the medical, educational and emotional needs of the young people, to develop transitional pathways across primary, second, and bring the clarity about those pathways and also involving primary care and the review the primary care contracting arrangements to ensure there's a provision for step down patients and provision of young people uh, 16 and below who's received intervention in primary care. So I think those are the piece of work, obviously working collaboratively with the primary care is important for us to take forward. Next slide, please. So we have agreed to create a process to share care agreement for prescribing responsibility in the primary care and making sure that primary care representation is there on the PENIC network, working together to improve the care. Next slide, please. From the epilepsy services finding, I said we got uh, we worked with all the services, eight services across, and we found very good practices are there, but also there are some gaps about the diagnosis, investigation, and ongoing management of children. The most important gap which we found about the provision of epilepsy specialist nurses across the services, and we find there were two services who lacked the uh, um, lacked the serve. Uh, uh, epilepsy service, epilepsy specialist nurses service into into the uh, in the care of the children. But since then, the project since we have faced this project, one service has managed to appoint a nurse, but there is still gap into the provision of epilepsy nurses across all the services, and I think they play a huge role in management of children in those ones. We found that there's a positive working relationship between primary, secondary and tertiary care, how that can be consolidated further. All the epilepsy 
trust across the region have a uh, specialist service uh, and they are representing in the PENIC. However, there is also lack of clear leadership into, into the services and we need epilepsy leads to take these services forward, which probably needs working together with the, uh, with the commissioners, how that can be consolidated. Next slide, please. I mentioned about the epilepsy nurses that there's a there is a, a lack of uh, educate epilepsy nurses across all the services, but there is at least one epilepsy nurse appointed in most of the services except one. The value of tri telephone trials has been highlighted by Dr. Nanda, and and uh, most of the services are providing some form of communication for the parents, patient, and uh, other services to approach the epilepsy service to take the advice. All the services have ECG, which is an important part of the diagnostic process, and also provision for MRI. Next slide, please. Uh, specialist epilepsy services are identifying and diagnosis in, in most of the patients, and the diagnose, accuracy of diagnosis has been highlighted in epilepsy 12 audit, and uh, in our reason it is approximately 97%, which is very good, and it comes uh, 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 reflected in, into the epilepsy 12 findings. Most secondary epilepsy services have an agreed referral pathway to tertiary care, which is very important because there are a lot of complex patients who need definitely input from the tertiary care because they need specialized care like epilepsy service, ketogenic diet. So we have a working relationship, but that can be consolidated further to having more clarity of the pathways in the future. Next slide, please. Areas of improvement are important because this is, has to be taken forward. The funding for the services improvement is present. At present is limited, as I said, the services need more input from the mental health point of view. They need more input from the epilepsy nurses point of view. So that's something has to be working with the commissioners and how that can be taken forward. Again, the improved arrangements of delivery and operational uh, of the services, clarity of the pathways across the primary and secondary services needs improvement. There's a need improvement about the patient management and the prescription, because that's again working along with the primary colleagues is important. Regular education and training is required, particularly in the primary care, but also in the education setting, which has been highlighted previously. There has to be an official recognition of clinical leadership in all the services and giving dedicated time to look into these outcome from these reports and, and how improvement can be done. Next slide, please. Only Half of the epilepsy services, they're using the best tariff criteria, which has been laid through the uh, uh, this clinic code, which we call two to three, and they have to use it. So we know exact number of patients who have been seen in this clinic, and also the resources can be used, utilized by the services. There is improve, the need for improvement access to the epilepsy nurses, who are uh, basically important, a link between the families, parents, education, and the services. Important aspect is to continue working with the epilepsy 12, uh, uh, and, and, and the time has to be dedicated to put the data into that so that we know exactly how the standards have been met by the different services. Next slide, please. I think I'm very much aware of my time. So obviously, these are the different areas of improvement which uh, are in relation to the sodium valproate prescription. As you, everybody knows, this medication has a tetrogenic effect. Also, uh, improvement in the transition, which has been uh, highlighted previously in some mental health, but also in the services, and, uh, uh, and uh, making a risk register of girls on a sodium valproate. Next slide, please. So overall, from the service point of view, there is a value and importance of good pediatric epilepsy care across our region, and the reports have identified the pockets of excellent practice with a clear willingness of among the professionals to work to improve the service. But also there are gaps which needs to be addressing uh, in, in, in coming months and years. Next slide, please. Anita has mentioned about the four work stream, which has been national work stream uh, into the mental health uh, screening, access to the tertiary uh, services, variation in the epilepsy care and transition 
from the pediatric. These are the important, uh, this slide basically is summarizing what I've already said, and we have put them together. Next slide, please. Scoping exercise against epilepsy 12, uh, national audit. This was part of the project which we completed. And uh, next slide. And the finding of epilepsy 12 round three in quarter two is almost similar to what I've already said. Most of the information which we gathered from our exercise are reflected in epilepsy 12 also. Obviously, epilepsy 12 was only limited to only 12 indicators, but we have looked into the wider aspect of uh, our uh, of the different aspect of the epilepsy care. Next slide, please. In summary, the network has resourced the scoping exercise and commits to the investment uh, in the future. The network has also developed a strategic relationship with the PANEC to improve the care of epilepsy care across the region and taking the deliverers forward, as Anita mentioned previously. Variation in the region exists, and that's the reality. However, we can improve uh, the, we can reduce the variation by having clear pathways across the primary, secondary, and tertiary care. Recommendation are aligning with epilepsy 12 findings for the improvement in epilepsy services across the region, and we need to have prioritize development of multi-agency systems and processes to remove and reduce the variation across the across the region for the children and young people. And we have formulated epilepsy align, panic alliance group which will be an important platform and reference group where all the different stakeholders will be coming and looking into uh, how the improvement can be made. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. So we have a five minute break. So I would like to think you'll be back here um, a couple of minutes past 25 past, so 27 minutes past 11 to give you five minutes to stretch your legs. Uh, please think about all of the things that have been said um, in the last uh, hour and, and a quarter and try to think about the things and in, in, in the ways in which um, you, you can contribute further to the resolution of many of the problems that have been identified. Uh, so we'll get together again, 27 minutes past 11, to, to have a final half an hour or so of discussion, please. Thanks a lot.
Hi, Louise. I was just away for a moment. Hi. I'm not. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Um, I'm just going to hand you over to Jeff. Right. Uh, thank you uh, for coming back uh, to, to have a final uh, period of discussion. Um, at the end of this, the, the, the time, I've been given a short period just to summarise things. But I, I, whilst I was listening to all of the presentations, I even I felt bombarded by all of the different recommendations that have been made by different bodies. I'm not, clearly, I'm not going to reiterate uh, those recommendations. But the people who are listening today and who will listen to this recorded message are interested in epilepsy in children and they want to make it better. And that goodwill is going to be really important because one of the little um, one-liners that I saw from, from, uh, Ram from uh, Ramesh was funding is limited. At the moment, the, the challenge will be how to follow the recommendations that have been made by the different groups and i believe that that is going to have to be initially by goodwill but then always thinking how do you sustain that and goodwill can only go so far so it's going to be how to be clever about this about how we promote the problems that you that each of the speakers have identified in gaining the funding that will be required to resource the changes which are needed one of the things in in the chat that has come back is, come back is, is what is the involvement in all of this? Um, as I even mentioned at the end of my brief introduction, what is the involvement of, of, of children and young people themselves? I, I wondered if if um, Catherine perhaps could 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 uh, tell us, or, or Catherine or, or Cameron could tell us what is the involvement of children and young people. Cameron, would you like to, to answer that in, in relation to young epilepsy's involvement? And then I'm sure colleagues from from the northeast can um, uh, can obviously add add any additional information. Uh, so, so just to confirm, um, so that's contribution of young people. Oh, I think 
Cameron is is struggling with his connectivity there. Whilst whilst he comes back to us, um, just to to let you know, I can provide some context in terms of young people with epilepsy's involvement in the program as a whole. So young epilepsy, we've been working really closely um, with um, with healthcare professionals and with NHS England to make sure that the views and experiences of young people with epilepsy are at the heart of this transformation program um, and that they're that these views and experiences are informing the priority areas so we've been supporting our youth voice network to participate at different levels in that so we've been um, supporting young people to participate in the um, in the uh, the national meetings so in, as part of the epilepsy oversight group also through the thematic working groups that Anita mentioned and we've also been um, facilitating young people's involvement at, at regional levels and also um, uh, with, with ICBs as well we're trying to connect with as many <clears throat> different areas as possible and we're always looking to grow our, our young people's network and um, we know that the young people who we're in contact with really value connecting with other young people who are living with the condition and um and they uh, they want to be part of these opportunities to to share what it's like for them and to to help improve services for for other young people you back cameron i think we lost you uh, hi there yeah having some major issues with teams this morning so apologies I was just um, um, explaining how we've been supporting the general work, but I wonder if you could say a little bit about how um, I know you worked with, you did some work with um, with Chloe as part of the project in terms of connecting with um, with the young people that we have in the northeast. Um, yeah, so um, thanks, Kevin. There, Catherine. Uh, yeah, so working on the national level, but um, we're really finding that the uh, young people across the UK are really enjoying and really getting a lot out of this regional level work. Um, so yeah, connecting uh, the young support to Chloe um, to that regional level. Um, really happy to for any further opportunities like that. That we we've got um, young people across all um, seven uh, regions, um, and we have a majority of ICSs. So um, if anyone's got any regional opportunities, I'd be happy to share that with our youth voice networks. Thank you. And we also obviously, uh, as was mentioned earlier, we will be supporting with the um, uh, with the mental health project. So uh, some, some of the young people that we're in contact with were part of the development of that. That's really interesting. Thank you for that. And uh, as part of the registration process, and um, what we had done is asked our participants to provide questions in advance. And we had received one question from investing in children that was specifically focused on that. So it's really helpful to hear. And I appreciate we did address that within Dr. Devlin's presentation. And, um, you know, Dr. Geegan explained about the, the methodology around that young person's engagement. I can see Dr. Kumar's got his hand up. I don't know if that's related to that conversation. I think that as a clinical lead, I think we are also looking into engaging with the young people support group, but also inviting uh, into our uh, PENIC Alliance group uh, as one of the stakeholder and also liaising and engaging with as many young people into individual services, which was part of the project one, but we could not complete it because of the lack of the time uh, and then the resource in that one. But definitely there's a focus uh, from the uh, PENIC Alliance to involve more and improving the experience of young people with epilepsy across the region. Uh, uh, so, so that's I'm just adding to to what other people, other members have said. Mm. Lovely. Yeah. That sounds that sounds great. Yeah, I'll put my um, email in the chat, and you could um, we'll get in contact about the opportunity. Um, also, just worth noting that uh, although we're um, really looking for regional level, any um, sort of general experiences of the views of children and young people with epilepsy uh, that we can share with our national network. So it might be in terms of like getting ideas on resources or um, any terminology like that, always happy to share national um, opportunities too. So we've got a couple of different opportunities for engagement. That'll, that'll be useful, Cameron. So me and Luis will work with with you and, and uh, take a thing forward. Thank you. Um, we, great. We've Thank all... you. We've also, Cameron, received a question directed at you in the chat, um, specifically um, from one of our epilepsy specialist nurses, who's also one of our panel members. Um, she's asking whether or not you have children and young people having a preference in relation to how they connect with one another, whether it be online, groups, face-to-face, -face, et cetera. What would be your view on that? 
Um, so our youth um, voice network re really um, was developed during sort of the heart of lockdown. So it was born mainly online. Um, and I think what, what that's done, it's really opened up the opportunity for nationwide networking amongst young people, which brings out um, a lot of benefits. And I think they really enjoy that part of it. But we, we're also finding a large percentage of our youth voice support network want to meet up in face to face a lot more. Um, so although um, the convenience of having teams calls on an, on a, like a Tuesday evening, for example, really works well with our team. We're really trying to increase and have regular opportunities for young people across the country to come and meet up together face to face. And we find like um, them sort of days are a lot more fluid. They're able to have sort of little side conversations throughout the day and share experiences, uh, which has been very useful. So I, I think there's not to make it accessible for everyone. I think young people, some young people prefer teams, some young people prefer face to face. So having um, sort of a hybrid of those two methods really works well. I think the technique about hybrid was is this is key isn't it especially we've we've now got this new way of working so yeah that's really helpful advice and guidance and i know we've spoken previously about this in re relation to the alliance i can see dr devlin has her hand up yeah i just wanted to come to the issue of of funding um and just make a comment about that in some ways it's uh tricky at the moment because um, trying to move things forward in a period of NHS uh, restructuring, uh, not just service model delivery restructuring, but financial restructuring is a is a challenge. Um, however, um, you know, and it can it can give you barriers and and and, and challenges to overcome, but it c can also disruption can also be an opportunity. And I think one of the things that's important for epilepsy is that. In the new structures of uh, ICBs, um, every time the children and young people's programme, part of that ICB work is mentioned, every time long term conditions are mentioned at ICB level for children, um, every time you know mental health comorbidities are mentioned, and children with epilepsy have the highest level of mental health comorbidities of any long term condition. Um, Any time health inequalities are mentioned, and there are twice as many children with epilepsy in the most deprived uh, quintile compared with the least deprived quintile in terms of uh, health inequalities. At ICB level, when those issues come up for discussion, it's really important, uh, and I hope that that this that today has helped that epilepsy, children and young people with epilepsy have a voice at that table when these issues are discussed. And for all of you, if you become involved in any of these new initiatives about ICB work streams, uh, be it variation, be it mental health, be it long term conditions, please uh, don't forget to give the children and young people with epilepsy a representation and a voice at that table, because through that, we may actually be able to tap into some new areas of funding streams, which we have previously not been party to. So um, I may be being overly optimistic there, but um, we, we, can, we can but try. I completely agree, Anita. If you're not optimistic, then you just you see an opportunity and you think, oh, it probably won't work and you don't bother. It's really important that that representation is there and active and the people you know who are in this 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 meeting this morning are the very people who are enthusiastic enough to be here and hopefully they will continue with that optimistic positive view by making sure that the, the issues raised today can be carried forward I'm just aware that we've had lots of discussion within the chat and um, Jeff, various issues, but one of the specific questions that's been highlighted is not necessarily in relation to the voice of young people. Um, it's it's more looking at specifically in relation to one of Dr Kumar's slides, it related to um, whether or not the network has considered wider health determinants and whether or not we might be able to support with um, young, children and young people with epilepsy and their access to employment opportunities. So I recognise that this is a kind of a transitions type question um, and I wonder whether or not Dr Kuma has anything that he might like to add in relation to that. I 
don't have a specific answer, but I, I, transition is important aspect of epilepsy care. And I think if I go back 10 years back, most of the children who are becoming adult, they used to be get referred to the primary care. Uh, and uh, then the care used to be taken from there. However, I can I can say at a personal experience and level that transition has been addressed at different forum. And we know now the adult services are preparing themselves to accept the patient and young people who are ready for transition. And they 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 obviously obviously are taking those steps forward. However, there is still lack of clarity of pathway at the different services across the region, but also across the country. And, and we are fortunate that in the network, we have a transitional uh, group who has been working uh, uh, together to find the clarity in the pathways for the different conditions in, in medical, different medical condition. And epilepsy has been part of that one. Uh, and uh, and and uh, we have incorporated some of their findings into our project, and we will be working closely with them, but also working closely with the commissioners, and also with the individual services that how they can implement those pathways in their own services to improve the experience. At a personal level, uh, uh, we spoke. We 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 definitely speak to our patient from the age of 13 and 14, depends upon the individual patient. At Southeast, we have also employed called transition coordinator and the role of that person to meet most of these patients who are under transition to go through their process and the journey to the adult services. And that coordinator has a role also to play with the, with the adult services so that transition becomes as smooth as possible. Just, so, just so I'm not sure whether I've answered the question, but this is I'm sharing that it needs working, but the work is still ongoing and, and hopefully there will be more clarity in the coming. I, I can add a little bit to that in relation yeah. to the work that's going on in respect to the transitions work stream, because as part of my role as children and young persons transformation lead, I'm also linked into obviously transitions, developmentally appropriate healthcare as one of the areas of work. And what I will say in relation to career planning and access to education and other, you know, training and employment opportunities, we are linked into the student pathways groups within um, further education and higher education establishments as part of the regional transitions group. So, uh, you know, I, I guess it's about that project need, needing to come in line with what's happening specifically for this cohort. I'd also like to just mention there that Kate has put in a link um, to some resources um, which might be helpful for colleagues. And also, Kate, you have your hand up. <coughs> I was just going to say that um, schools have a statutory duty to prepare children for careers education and um, the Gatsby Foundation have created a suite of benchmarks which are statutory for schools. Um, and basically within those benchmarks, you know, one of them is about personal guidance and linking curriculum to careers. Um, but also ensuring that they've got encounters with further and higher education experience of workplaces. So if we are looking at children holistically and we are doing our job as ed ed educators, we should really be supporting children, even, you know, regardless of whether they've got epilepsy or not, to enter into the workplace. I think there's a separate conversation to be had around um, the impact of epilepsy on things like driver's licenses and the impact that that then has on career aspiration. And that's such a significant part of um, that journey and transition into adulthood that I, I don't know whether in, in education settings we fully understand the consequences of epilepsy and the impact that that does have on children in their future career. What I would say as well is that, um, you know, for those children with epilepsy who have an education healthcare plan, and that, that's a you know a very specific group of of, of sen children. Um, they have a section on that plan where it's called preparing for adulthood and journeying into adulthood. And as they approach key stage four and key stage five, they go through that year nine into year ten transition. That becomes a real key focus and drive, so that these people do get access to employment opportunities. So I think um, it, it very much depends on the the, the child's presentation. The, the child's cognitive ability, their social, emotional, mental health and well-being, but actually the child needs to be looked at holistically by the careers leader within that school setting. I hope that makes sense. 
I think in, in as I get what you have mentioned, other there are three aspects of transition which we have come across. One is the medical aspect. I think people are working on those pathways. However, equally important is education and the social care. And and those are the basically. So I think there's a lack of collaboration between medical, social, and the education thing. And sometimes it works good for a, if the if most of the parents are very advocate for the children, so they they work hard through the system and trying to get the best for the children. However, I think uh, this will be a good piece of work for the future. That how these three uh, 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 areas can work together to provide the best experience for that child and for the for the family in in the transition pathway. There's lots of conversations within the chat around transition and obviously Emma Pell was part of this group previously. She's what she's left, unfortunately, but uh, you know, we'll continue to pick through the questions. Another direct question that's come out of the chat, which I think is, is really helpful. And obviously we need to, to ask the relevant experts about the availability of any specific data of, about young women or counselling um, regarding reproduction all anti-epileptic medication and the mental health consequences. And that was on the back of the slide about the sodium valparate and obviously those conversations. Um, I don't know whether or not Dr. Kumar or Dr. Jayachandra might be able to um, respond to that question specifically. I think Helen will be a good person, Helen Gilpin, because in our service, uh, she has been uh, a lead uh, to create a sort of a register for the ch young girls who are on this medication and how we go through the information with the parents and the families who are put on this medication. Helen, is it OK you share your experience? Um, hi, yeah, so the support really is just through us as nurses, sort of speaking with the families and um, their wishes. Um, through sodium valparate, etc., whether the child um, then goes on to the prevent program um, or whether we try other medications leading into sort of like that early adolescence. Um, and yeah, that's it. It is completely on an individual basis, really, for those children. So I think there is no national register or uh, there is no national guidance that we may need to maintain a register of children who are on the this medication, specific sodium valparate. However, there is an alert from MRHA that any child or any a young girl who's been put on this medication has to go through a counseling process with the child and with the parents, and that has to be recorded in the notes. So we do record this thing and, and also go through the prevent program, which Helen has mentioned. We felt as part of the project, there should be some collective information that how many patients or girls are in this medication across the region. And that is something which we are going to speak in PENIC meeting. Obviously, there is a, a how that register can be maintained. I'm not sure at this stage, but that something will be discussing across the PENIC and, and, uh, and, and uh, hopefully that will provide more information. Whereas uh, any adult who is beyond 18 on any epilepsy medication, they normally have a register maintained because the risk of pregnancy and tetragenicity of any medication. So in adult practice, it's different as compared to pediatrics. Yeah. I think as well, I don't know if any other sort of epilepsy nurses there, um, we're finding a lot of questions now as well for our young boys. Um, obviously, um, with the upcoming recommendations from the MHRA and um, regarding the boys and the further research and um, that's that's been taken part um, about sort of male fertility as well taking um, sodium valparate. So we're waiting for further guidance from them as well about that. Great, thank you. I'm aware that Dr Jayachandran had his hand up and wonder whether or not he wanted to add to that. Uh, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Um, within our trust, we have a database uh, of children, young persons who are on sodium valparate. Uh, I think Sue is on the call, our epilepsy nurse specialist. Um, she works very hard. We uh, had two recent recruits, so uh, she makes sure uh, that uh, the prevent program, um, the forms, there is, um, there are some paperwork to be completed after discussion. Um, with the, um, a young person and the family. 
uh, and um, I think she does not miss out and she just chases us and asks for um, uh, the children who are under us. So it it it, it is being done, uh, but um, I don't know how effectively um, we could continue it in the future. Thanks for that. Um, I'm aware Dr Nanda has a hand up and also Amanda Boardman. Um, uh, sorry, Dr Nanda, I realise that was a, a, a few moments ago. Is that still relevant to pick up the point? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, this is in relation to sodium valproate because uh, young people do come to us for contraception. So following MHRA alert, we do run a search and proactively, uh, you know, address this issue with um, our young patients. I mean, I've never had a discussion with men, uh, with young boys, but definitely with uh, young girls. But whether this practice is consistent is very difficult to say because every practice get MHRA alerts, but, you know, does everyone act on it? So I think that's something which we could look into. Thank you. And and then Amanda, I, I'm not sure if your comments related to that or something else. I, I appreciate you put a chat in there about the links to adults. Yeah, so, sorry, I'm Mandy Bourbon. I'm uh, one of the GP leads over in North Cumbria. Um, but I, was, I have put in the chat as well. I'm also a parent of a of a young man with epilepsy. So it's actually really good to hear uh, this conversation today from a personal point of view and really glad to hear that people are starting to think about actually the impact of medication on fertility of boys as well, because I definitely think that's uh, something that, that is kind of forgotten because of the, the huge issue that, the, that we talk about with Valparate with girls. Um, just talking about the because I've got an ICB wide role um, and taking on point the, the the fact that with the moment it feels like a very difficult um, conversation to have within the ICB about funding and things. Um, we've got three people here today: myself, Claire Scarlett, and Emma Cheatham, who work for the London Disability Network, um, who've been trying to engage with the ICB medical directors on making sure that epilepsy for all ages is looked at across the ICB as a priority. Um, so we would really appreciate the opportunity to be able to work more closely with with your network going forward to try and see if we can actually expand um, from not just children and young people but into the adult world as well and maybe the first route into through that would be through the transition group um, but we're certainly got a very passionate group as well and, and be very happy to be engaged uh, going forward. Yes that's great I've just put in the chat there we're actually already linked Emma and I uh, we've lined up in relation to the available data and stuff and we link we and Emma's part of our regional transition steering group so that's that that connectivity is happening just to provide assurance. Um, Dr. Devlin, you've got your hand up. You're on mute. Sorry, Catherine kindly put a link into Core 20 plus five. Uh, and I don't know how many of you are aware of that, uh, the programme in adults that was launched first. But we were pleased to see that the programme was brought forward for children and young people. Some of you may know what that means, um, but basically the core, uh, it's an NHS England initiative to reduce health inequalities and it should come with some funding. Uh, in terms of the core 20, that's the 20% the most deprived in the population. The plus groups are particular target populations and um, it links in with what Amanda's just said because one of the plus populations are um, people with learning disability and autism. So they appear in one of the plus groups of that initiative. And then the five are the five nominated conditions. And what you can see is that asthma, diabetes and epilepsy feature, as does oral health and mental health, which we've been talking about today. So for those of you who are invited to core 20 plus five approaches, um, Please link that up in the sense that children who have the most severe learning disability, up to 50 percent of them will have epilepsy. There's a huge overlap between that plus group and uh, one of the designated groups with epilepsy. Likewise, if you're at any discussions about mental health, what about mental health in long term conditions and what about mental health for children with learning disability and autism? So there's a big overlap. And I think if we work together in those groups, 
um, any funding streams or any initiatives that we get wind of, we can uh, work together to try and maximise the focus uh, on those three elements. Um, so if people haven't caught up with that yet, then please follow Catherine's link and um, and keep it in mind if you're invited to any core 20 plus five conversations. Thanks for that. I'm just mindful of time now in relation to um, the, the programme. Um, so as a commitment, I'll continue to work through the chat and make sure that we've provided any direct responses to questions out with the meeting. Um, and if I just hand to our chair, um, who can then give a give an overview and summation before before we hear a bit more about the network and the closure slides. Um, having been retired for um, uh, uh, over just over a year, I was very interested to be invited to be chairman of this meeting. And I am much impressed by the enthusiasm and the progress that has been made in all of the different areas that have been touched upon. I think that um, the cooperation between these groups, we often talk about people being in silos and not really talking to each other. This is so vitally important that this has been a forum to share the concerns that we have for children and young people who, of course, are the focus of our concern here. One of the big links, I'm really impressed that there are people from the United States uh, and the, the, uh, the, the somebody in, from London uh, uh, in education uh, listening in here. And I think that link is so important that we get healthcare plans done regularly, annually reviewed, and that there is a link not only in one way, but in the other, that, that education have got an easy access to expert advice from epilepsy specialist nurses and consultants with expertise in epilepsy. Um, about eight, nine years ago, the British Pediatric Neurology Association asked me to develop a, uh, a slide package, an educational package for epilepsy nurse specialists to be able to provide that sort of information to teachers. And I'm presently making uh, inquiries uh, about where that has gone, um, because I know it was it was actively considered and it, it sort of got stalled by too many people getting involved. But it is a project which I know is there and needs to be, I think, it will be really usefully uh, um, explore, you know, used now to help epilepsy specialist nurses in 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 getting their information across to, to teachers. Primary care, it's a big problem because I see a very similar problem in, in diabetes, where the expertise in diabetes in children is, is so uh, different from adults that the hospital tends to take over. But And yet we can't exist without primary care involvement and how we, we break down those uh, um, uh, barriers and, and make sure that uh, we do have good communication with primary care. Uh, and of course, uh, CAMs, um, psychologists, uh, we found in Sunderland that what we, what we employed a psychologist who actually contributed to several different uh, areas uh, 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 in diabetes uh, and, and then in, in uh, children who had chronic fatigue syndrome. And we had to be novel in our approach to, to be able to get funding together to be able to do that. So. As, as Nita has said, funding streams are there, applying for them is really important. In the meanwhile, please uh, maintain your enthusiasm for this hugely important uh, um, um, subject. There are more children in ep with epilepsy in the area in, in, in where, you, where you're working than there are children with diabetes. Uh, so it, it is a considerable problem. Um, we need to keep chipping away at it. And, and thank you very much indeed, Louise, for having organized this meeting. Uh, uh, and uh, I hope to be uh, to, co to continue, continue to be involved. Uh, could I pass across to Amelia Salisbury, who is the Network Development Manager, to close off, please.
Thank you, Jeff. And I want to say a huge thank you to you and the team for um, a fantastic session. Um, really insightful and um, really, really enjoyed it. So I'm just going to give you an overview of some of the work happening um, as we move forward. So Anita touched on the core 20 plus five slide and um, gave a really detailed overview of that. So thank you very much. We also have um, work going on to our, with our Healthier Together website and app. So if you um, if you'd like to move the slides on, Jen, that'd be great. Thank you. So there's a mobile application um, and the um, there has been a huge interest and um, over the past few months, increased usage of, of the website for families um, and local um, practitioners signposting and using um, the information for um, to support families with um, poorly children. Um, and if you move slides, Jen, there's a couple of QR codes and these will be shared in the um, in the slides. So you'll be able to, to share these with colleagues as well. In the next slide, um, it's um, our opportunities to get involved. So if you've signed up to the network today, you will be receiving our Child Health Tuesday newsletter, as well as a quarterly um, uh, newsletter, which is in um, uh, more focused into different projects, whereas Child Health Tuesday gives you um, an opportunity to get involved with different events. We've got a range of different huddles, um, planned for the next um, few months, including our next star huddle in May, which is all about our dance artists and residents. And then there's a number of reports and resources, including um, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to launch our education advisors project, which is where the Kate and the team looked at how to um, support health care organisations to research into schools so that will be shared um, that we launched in the next couple of weeks um, and then our final slide is different links um, to, to get the newsletter and different links to, to create join our different um, opportunities such as our network of networks and again the link to Healthier Together so please please do get in touch and um, thank you all for your time and we're two minutes over. <laughs> well again thank you to you all um, I hope you have a, a productive remainder of the day thanks very much indeed for being here with us uh, at this in this forum thanks a lot bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.